Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and children of all ages, welcome back here to the Prince of Investment, coming to you guys and girls live all the way from the city and state of Denver, Colorado, via Honolulu, Hawaii. Thank you guys and girls for tuning in. And I also want to say, I don't have a lot of time, and I definitely know you guys and girls don't have a lot of time, so we're going to jump straight into it. So as you can see in today's topic, we're going to be talking about REITs with the intelligent REIT investor himself. He's all the way live from South Carolina. He has, you know, written so many books. We're going to talk about his latest book, so you guys and girls stay around for a treat. But he has amassed over 100,000 followers on Seeking Alpha. He's written over 3,000 articles on Seeking Alpha. He's done great things. He's been on the show before. I'm definitely glad to have him back. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want to sit here today. You guys and girls sit tight or who's catching the playback. If you're catching this live, sit back. We're going to talk about REITs, uh, real estate investment in 2008 versus 2021. What would he have done different coming in that physical real estate, having so much commercial real estate being wiped out by 2008 and looking at the market today? So there's so many things to talk about, REITs versus stocks, land versus REITs, all that good stuff like that. So you guys and girls stay tuned. So without any further ado, let me welcome my guest, Mr. Brad Thomas. How are you doing today, sir? Great to see you again, Prince. I got to say, you have the coolest show. I go on a lot of shows, and you you have the coolest show that I've ever gone on. So I, I'm going to give you that. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. You know, I know you probably said that to everybody, Brad, but I feel thanks for making me, thanks for making me feel special. I really appreciate that. I do bet. It's good to, good to see you again. And, uh, you know, look, I think we did this thing uh, before COVID, so... Uh, I'm glad, mm -hmm. to, glad to see you again. Glad you're healthy and your family's healthy, and uh, it's great to see you. Great to see you again. Okay, great. So the first thing I want to get into was looking at your history and you know looking at some of your recent recent interviews and things like that. Knowing your past, how you said you spoke about it in 2008, you got so much commercial real estate, you got into malls and shopping centers and things like that. And you say you got a little bit too greedy and you didn't diversify. And 2008 came in and it was pretty heart wrenching for you and your partner with everything that happened with real estate. Now, look at the real estate market in 2020. Um, you're seeing right now, for some reason, we thought when the pandemic happened, maybe real estate was going to take a dip. But no, real estate is like at an all time high right now. How do you feel about the 2008 market versus the 2021 market in real estate in general? It's a great question. And of course, you know, I'm a little older than you. So I've gone through a couple of recessions and the 2008, 2009 recession. Of course, they call it the Great Recession for a reason. And it was a, it was it was very challenging for me. but frankly, for anyone who was in real estate, or really in the financial market, banking, any of the, any of the financial sectors. But of course, um, you know, nobody could prepare for what we, what we saw in 2020 in this, this, you know, black swan, this global pandemic. And uh, it was, it was pretty gut-wrenching. I mean, I was sitting here, uh, you know, at home and it was, um, you know, it was some challenging months. We didn't know exactly you know, what was going to happen and nobody did. And, you know, but I'll tell you what, Prince, I mean, you know, real estate is a unique um, asset class because it is real property. And I would drive around and although the some of the stocks that we were investing in were, were tanking, almost uh, every, you know, every stock in the, in, the, in the beginning of the pandemic was tanking, we knew that the real estate values we're still going to be fine. That it, the, these shopping centers and these industrial buildings and these office buildings uh, we're still going to be around, and eventually they're going to lease back up. And so now we're seeing this recovery unfold, and investors are making a lot of money. We've we've done extremely well, really. You know, in Warren Buffett's words, buying into that into that fear, um, we've really done well. Uh, and you know, again, you had to be a you had to be an experienced investor to really understand it and take advantage of some of this fear that was in the market last year. But we've seen some incredible returns. Uh, coming out of this pandemic, and there's still there's still quite a bit of runway left for investors who want to invest in these real estate stocks. Okay, so I'm glad you said that. Back in 2020, when we seen the pandemic go down, um, you always spoke about before the pandemic. You said, "Hey, this is a great way to diversify away from stocks." You know, some people have stocks, some people. So you know, a great way to diversify, get into real estate. You know, real estate is so tangible. You don't want to do all that work. You can just let someone else do the work and get into REITs. 
But in 2020, when the stock market dropped, so did we see the REIT market. You're saying, hey, the actual physical real estate market, we didn't really see a big fall in it, but we saw the fall with REITs. Why is that? Sure. Well, you know, again, there's there's advantages and disadvantages to owning public companies. Uh, in fact, I would cite one of the advantages for REITs is the fact they are liquid. You can buy and sell them in any time. And if you go try to sell your duplex or your rental house or whatever your real estate is, you know, it, it, it's not instant uh, li liquidity. It takes, you have to market the property, fix up the property, hire the broker. Hopefully the, the buyer will, you know, get a loan or be able to, you know, bring bring cash to the closing. And so it, it takes a while maybe before that, that process to, could take months and months to occur. So one of the benefits of owning a REIT, a real estate investment trust, again, which is a real estate stock, is that there is liquidity. Now, of course, the downside to that, the other side of that is with liquidity comes volatility because the market's going to wake up. You know, every Mr. Market is uh, uh, mm -hmm. Benjamin Graham, Warren Buffett's mentor would say, Mr. Market is going to wake up every day and he may be in a good mood or he may be in a bad mood or he may be in a, a great mood. But but obviously in the pandemic, uh, the Mar Mr. Market uh, was not in a good mood. And so we had this volatility in 2020. There was, again, a lot of fear in the market. Um, so that's those are the, that's the trade-off you have as, as, a, as a public stock investor, whether it's a real estate stock or, or any, any stock that's publicly traded, you have those, those issues. But I will, I will cite two other major advantages, and these are major advantages for owning real estate stocks or REITs. And the second advantage, it, which really goes, is directly correlated to this liquidity uh, uh, argument that I just mentioned is the transparency. So unlike some of the private partnerships I had where I didn't have full transparency with my business partners and some of the underlying, you know, uh, um, issues with this, with these, uh, with, with the business model, I just did not have that transparency. I didn't manage the property. So I had to deal with a third party manager. So you just don't have that transparency. Of course, with a public company, you have what's called the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC. These companies, as you know, are required to report these financials on a quarterly basis. And an annual, of course, we get annual reports and study all of this, all of this data. And you have all of this, you know, publicly available information on hand. We're actually in the middle of earnings right now. So we, we go through all of the quarterly earnings. So that's an advantage. The, the other one that I think is important, and again, this is where I really found out the difference when I was going through my, I guess, my transition uh, in life from the private side to the public side, is the fact that REITs have uh, tremendous diversification. So you can essentially uh, gain access to any property type. Um, it's it's amazing, Prince, to see the number of different property types that you can invest in today. Ten years ago, who would have imagined that you can invest in cannabis real estate? Who would imagine that you can invest in cell towers? Who would have, who could imagine you can invest in data centers and farming and even prisons? Believe it or not, I would not invest in prisons, by the way, but there's mm -hmm. some, if you want to, that's a, that's an option. Uh, so you have all of these uh, real estate property sectors that you can invest in, and that provides tremendous diversification. And I will add one other thing is we cover U.S. stocks, but we also look at the whole global landscape. So there are REIT-like uh, uh, structures in about 40 countries. I just returned from Paris and uh, Barcelona just a couple of weeks ago. And looking at some of the properties uh, in in uh, in Paris and in and in Spain, and so there are a number of ways you can you can diversify your portfolio. And probably the last thing I'll throw in there, Prince, is management. Most of these public companies, not all, but most of these public management teams, uh, do an excellent job. And the reason that they that we had confidence uh, in this pandemic is the fact that most of these companies had very low leverage. They had very disciplined capital structures. Um, and so, you know, and, and frankly, they had adequate liquidity, most of these companies, to navigate this once in a lifetime global pandemic. So uh, REITs were definitely the place to be. And again, for, for the individual investor, you know, I, I think I said this, Prince, last time you and I spoke, you know, well over a year ago, 
Um, and that is, you know, I, get, I turn on the TV every night and I'm sure you do too. And you flip through these, your cable channels and you see all these, you know, flip, uh, house flipping shows and all the reality shows about real estate. And, you know, but the, the reality, the reality is most of most, most people, average Joe or average Jane, they don't understand how to flip a house. They don't have, you know, three to $400,000 to go out and buy five duplexes and rent them out, you know, but, but my product that I, that I teach and preach is all you need is a dollar. All you need is, you know, you don't even need one share of stock. You can invest in these, these public companies. Um, and, and so the barrier to entry is very, very low. Anybody can, can get into this business. And so um, I just want your audience to be aware of that, that this, you know, anybody can invest in real estate stocks or REITs. Okay. Now, I want to ask you this, this uh, next question before we go into this break. Um, you were known for in 2008, you bought a lot of commercial property, right? And then we hit the pandemic in 2020. And you are seeing that, you know, a lot of commercial properties, you know, companies are on Zoom now, uh, TV, television shows are doing Zoom, you know, commercial real estate is kind of not as in demand as it once was. How do you feel about that space now, especially uh, back in 2008, you're saying, hey, I think we increased the inventory too much. How do you feel about that commercial real estate space now before we head into break? Right. Well, uh, the bottom line is this. I think technology has been a tremendous uh, disruptor, not only in the real estate world, but just in, in, in this in the world. And so in the property sector, we actually cover prop tech now. There are a number of really innovative companies that have made it uh, more efficient to lease up buildings um, and, and do all types of, of, real, of functions to make real estate uh, more, much more efficient. So what we've seen in, during COVID is an acceleration in those companies that really have, have adapted to technology and enhanced their, their business models to utilize technology. I'll, I'll specifically cite logistics companies, for example. These are sim simply warehouses that are leased to companies like Amazon or FedEx. But there's a lot of a lot of technology in those companies. I mean, that's Amazon as a technology uh, business. And we've seen that in data centers as well. I mean, obviously there's been a tremendous uh, acceleration in, in data centers. And, and you mentioned Zoom. Well, guess what? You know, these the, what we're recording right here, this particular, this, this segment of this show, that is right now, as we speak, going to a data center, it's going into a cloud. I probably invest in one of those data centers, or I'm an investor in one of those data centers that you're utilizing for your Zoom technology for us to discuss this, right, to communicate right now. The cell towers, I'm using a cell tower right now that's taking this signal to the, to the cell tower for this show, and we invest in cell tower REITs. So technology has been a great thing just like any business, if you haven't adapted to that technology, you're going to be lost, you know, in the dark ages. And there are certain businesses that that haven't adapted. And I'll, it's uh, specifically malls. And I'll be real quick because I know you got to go on break. But we already said even last year or two years ago, we have too many malls in, in the U.S., just way too many. There's 1,400 malls prior to COVID. And a lot of those we've seen now the online demand and a lot of people buying, especially apparel. Um, online and a lot of the things you, you can now get, you know, with through Amazon. So we're seeing a uh, an evolution. It's not a complete going to be a complete wipeout, but we're going to see a continued deceleration of mall closures uh, or acceleration of mall closures in the U.S. Uh, as it relates to technology and just the you know the, what Amazon's doing. They've really changed the playing field for retail. So every property sector is really going to have a different uh, kind of application with regard to technology. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go on a break. And I mean a very quick break. You stay more. So you stay here to get more from the, uh, the intelligent reinvestments of Brad Thomas. We're going to be talking about his book next. And we're going to give away some copies here. So y'all better stay tuned if you want to get some copies of Brad Thomas, the intelligent reinvestor. All right. See you soon. Aloha, I'm Christine Linders, physical therapist and board certified orthopedic clinical specialist, and I am the host of Movement Matters, 
a show that is designed to bring you the best physical therapy tips and exercises so that you can have your best body and do all the things that you love. You can watch my show every other Tuesday at 11 a.m. on thinktechhawaii.com where I show you instructional videos from the top of your head to the bottom of your toes to get your body feeling its best. Remember, life is better when you listen to your physical therapist. I'll see you on Tuesday. The Intelligent Reinvestor is here live with us today, Mr. Brad Thomas. He's here live with us today. We've been talking about REITs, REITs versus stocks, and we're talking about the commercial real estate. Using that experience that he had, they always say that you can learn a lot from when someone do something right, but you can learn even more when you do something wrong. I'm pretty sure I butchered that quote, but it goes something like that. But uh, so <laughs> we talked about his 2008 experience, uh, holding physical properties in real estate, getting into commercial real estate, going into now, as we're seeing the craze, especially in the single family homes. But we have him here live today. So ladies and gentlemen, give a nice round of applause. If you're just checking in, Mr. Brad Thomas, how you doing today, sir? Doing great. And again, once again, it's good to see you and it's great to be back on your show. All right. Awesome. Now, I want to get into something here. Um, the first thing I want to talk about, you recently wrote about this. Um, you talked about two high yield REITs that could soar, right? And one of them being your Omega Healthcare, right? And broad market. It's a commercial real estate, more commercial mortgage REIT. The healthcare one kind of makes sense. But where are we going with this uh, mortgage one? So tell us about these two high yielding REITs, why are they high yielding and why they could store. Sure. Well, of course, you know, yields, a lot of people love yield and who doesn't, right? That's the shiny new toy that, uh, you know, we'd like to, we'd like to have and it means income, higher income, higher yield. And so these particular companies, again, one, you're right, one is a healthcare REIT, and actually specifically they're in the skilled nursing sector, which has really been challenged significantly. So one of the reasons that this company does have a high yield is because the market has traded off. Again, Mr. Market, as I alluded to earlier on the earlier segment, uh, has not been in favor of skilled nursing. Why is that? Because of the labor shortage. You know, you think about it, a lot of these nursing homes are under tr still tremendous pressure with COVID and now the Delta variant um, because of uh, vaccines. So, you know, they're having to require vaccines. So there's just a lot, there's a lot of poli politics in, in this as well. So the labor issues have really put pressure on skilled nursing operators. And so that's, again, put pressure on this company, Omega Healthcare, and some peers just like Omega. And so that's what has elevated this yield, which is around 9%. Company actually just produced earnings, generated earnings today. And they actually did fairly well. Uh, so we're gonna be watching this and obviously listening to the earnings call tomorrow. Now, the other company you mentioned is called Broadmark. You're right. And they are a commercial mortgage REIT. And, and you've, you've actually done your homework. I'm very impressed. Not only is the, you have the coolest show, you actually do your homework and I'm very impressed. But Broadmark is a commercial mortgage REIT. They yield around 8%. Now this is, they have a very simple business model. They lend money to home builders, and apartment builders. Um, so if you want to go build a house or two houses, uh, they'll loan money to you to go build a house, you can buy the land, to frame it, put it all together, put the roof on it. Uh, their average customers probably, they probably lend about a million to $2 million per customer. So they'll have maybe four houses up, maybe five houses up going at a time. Um, now they, they charge around 12% on average, which again, sounds like a lot of money, but it's virtually 100% financing. So some of these small builders, they'll go out and they'll have a business partner who will help them you know, fund the house and they'll give that partner some money or you know, some of the profits. So the, it, this is a very successful model. The key to this business model as, as is with any mortgage REIT is just underwriting the credit, underwriting you know, the borrower, just like a bank, to make sure that you know when the money goes out, the money is going to come back in, and so Broadmark has done a very good job of of sourcing uh, their their uh, and under really underwriting their uh, developers, their builders. Uh, they do they do have some trouble loans. Obviously, the pandemic was tough last year. There are a number of builders who just frankly weren't able to pay 
So they're having to work through some of those defaults. Um, and that's, again, what's calls a little pressure to the stock price. But we, one thing we do, and we spend a lot of time, is we, we not only underwrite these companies, we speak with these management teams on a regular basis. I have calls just like you do here with me. We have calls almost every single day, if not multiple times a day, with management teams really digging into their businesses. So with Broadmark specifically, we've looked at that company, and we believe that the, the dividend is, is sustainable, and the company is, is doing a really good job at underwriting the risk uh, for that business model. And again, you know the demand of housing today. And um, so that's really what I really like about the business model. And Warren Buffett said it best, if, you know, you've got to understand that business. And if you really understand this business of, of lending money to single family housing, especially in the Sunbelt markets where I'm located, you know, Florida and Texas are some dominant markets for them where they deploy capital. Uh, it's been a great market. And so uh, we like those companies, and again, but we've done our homework, just like you've done your homework here for this show, uh, to make sure that these are safe companies. Even though they're higher yield, uh, we believe they are safe. Okay. Now I want to ask you this question. You spoke about it earlier. The Cannabis Real Estate, not Real Estate Investment Trust, uh, Cannabis REIT. Tell us about that. Do you think cannabis is on the brink of being uh, legalized on a federal level? And tell us about this Cannabis REIT that you were talking about earlier. Well, actually, what's interesting, Prince, is there's one company we cover, and they just uh, announced earnings today, called Innovative Industrial. And their ticker symbol, uh, if you want to do some research, their ticker symbol is IIPR. They were the first... Uh, Cannabis REIT, we call that the first mover advantage. So they got in early. Uh, they built a very large base. In, they launched a couple of years ago. I forget the date, but it was at least, say, four to five years ago. Um, and they have grown. And I use this a lot, play on words, pun intended. They, they have growing like a weed. Um, and so, uh, you know, um, that was the first mover. They're growing at a rate of about 35% per year. Now, that's their earnings growth uh, mode historically. And then what we see is the forecast. Uh, so they were the first out. Now we've had a couple other companies that have um, be, uh, listed as, ca as cannabis REITs. We have uh, one is a mortgage REIT ca called AFC Gamma. Um, and I don't know who came up with the name, but that's it, AFC Gamma. They're based down in West Palm Beach. And I uh, actually met with them a couple of uh, weeks back. And uh, we just initiated coverage on them. Then we have two other uh, traditional equity reach, which means they own the brick and mortar. Um, and so one of them is a really small company called Power REIT. Their ticker symbol is PW. They're actually a nano cap. So a nano cap means they have a market cap of un under 100 million, but they've done extremely well. Now, it's high, as you know, it's, it's higher risk to invest in these, these small caps or nano caps. There's a lot of volatility with those companies, but there are now actually four companies in that space. Now, you hit the nail on the head, Prince, is the, the safe banking laws, the really the big overhang for this cannabis sector is at some point in time in the future, it's not a matter of, 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 of um, if, it's just a matter of when uh, the federal uh, laws change and the safe uh, uh, banking laws uh, uh, are, are formed, then it's going to basically allow the federally charted banks to lend money uh, well, you're in Denver, so you know this well, because you've got a cannabis, a pro-cannabis uh, state, but you're going to see these these uh, these banks open up and they will actually be able to lend money. Now, th is that going to, um, how is that going to impact these REITs? Because right now the REITs are taking advantage of this opportunity because there's really relatively not many, many uh, firms that will, that will uh, uh, invest in these larger mm -hmm. cannabis facilities. But we believe, and we've talked to these management teams quite a bit, France, we believe that even with those laws that these companies like IIPR, Innovative Industrial, will still be able to generate very attractive uh, double-digit returns. Um, and so, you know, I think it's here to stay. I mean, obviously, we know cannabis is still exploding, but I think the big, the, the elephant in the room is when those safe laws do, um, do uh, go in the books. You know how will that impact some of these REITs? And again, we feel we still we feel fairly favorable. But again, this is somewhat of a I always like to warn, you know, investors, especially beginners. I mean, this is still cannabis is still an early innings 
um, um, asset class. And so there's a lot of volatility. So obviously, if you're going to invest in those types of companies, you always need to make sure you, you manage or maintain adequate diversification uh, and, and invest in some more stable uh, property sectors as well as cannabis. But we like cannabis a lot. I will say, I'll, I'll look right now because I've got my screen open here. Uh, can, the cannabis REITs were one of our top performing REITs. Uh, Power REIT was up like 83% year to date, for example, and just really uh, innovative. Is that they did like 80% uh, this year. They did like in the year of a pandemic, I, I don't know, have the numbers in front of me, but but this is amazing that they they returned something like 80 to 90 percent in the year of a global pandemic, you know, which is mm. which is crazy. But anyway, cannabis is definitely a hot sector, and I think it's going to continue uh, uh, to be interesting. But I would definitely maintain diversification. All right. Now we're going to jump into this real quick. We're going to bring up the cover of your book, right? This is the intel. This is your newest book, The Intelligent REIT Investor, right? This is your newest book. So the first person to email me, my email address, Prince, P-R-I-N-C-E, at childrenfinancialliteracy.org. That's all plural, right? Uh, I'm a singular, I'm sorry. Children, no S, literacy, childrenfinancialliteracy.org. So Prince, P-R-I-N-C-E, at childrenfinancialliteracy.org. Org. I know it sounds like a lot, but it's really not. But you send me an email, you're going to get a free copy of Mr. Brad Thomas' latest book, The Intelligent Reinvestor, sent your way. And when you do email me, please send me your address because I do need a place to send it. Okay. But now I want to jump into something. Uh, another topic you recently wrote about yesterday, you talked about corporate taxes in 2022. What's important? What do I need to know about the corporate taxes in 2022? This is going to be our last question before we got to, before we got to run and close out the show. Yeah, well, look, I think this article is specifically on corporate taxes, not really individual taxes. Um, I'll say this, and I didn't really go into a lot of detail because I know we're going to be talking the topic of real estate, but one of the things that I think is really important on corporate taxes and specifically real estate is that you know there was there's been discussion um, in the, within the Biden administration of eliminating this 1031 exchange law, which essentially was a great tool or still is a great tool for both corporations but also individual investors to take a a property, a rental house, a duplex, a piece of farmland, and be able to sell it and then take that capital gain and exchange it into a like kind property. And so there was a lot of fear out there. Uh, REITs actually use those like kind exchanges too. They're called 1031 exchanges. So one thing I do want to say, and this is actually a bit of good news, is that it appears that that law is going to, it's been around the books over a hundred years. It's, it's really a long-term law. And it was, it was actually designed for the individual investor, not really the corporation, but that would have uh, really impacted the real estate market. So I did want to make mention that. I didn't go into detail about that in the article, but I think that's a law that I think will be impactful to real estate. The other thing I want to say is that REITs, and again, it's all in my book, um, probably the first or second chapter of the book. Um, it's we talk about you know the law, the REIT laws, and the great thing about a real estate investment trust, Prince, is that these companies must pay out ninety percent of their taxable income. So the REITs actually don't pay a whole lot of taxes, and I get this I get this question a lot, and I think it's important. Um, because, um, but it, because a lot of people think this is just a loophole, you know, this, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get people to invest in some kind of a loophole opportunity, but it's really not. REITs have been around since 1960. That's during the Eisenhower administration. So, you know, a long time, uh, well over 60 years uh, of history. And, and so the individual investor has to pay taxes. Um, and a lot of the people who own REITs, they own them in tax deferred accounts. So I want to point that out. I think in terms of the corporate taxes in the U.S., obviously, you know, we're going to Biden. The Biden uh, policies uh, are going to increase taxes for corporations, but again, REITs are in a better, much better position because they don't really pay taxes. It's those individual investors that pay taxes. And again, this kind of goes back to real estate and why I think you know, it was important to own real estate as part of your asset allocation plan. There's a lot of wealth that's being created in real estate if you. If you go on the Forbes list and look at the number of billionaires 
um, that 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 own real estate, uh, a large majority of them created that wealth be because of real estate. In fact, if you look at the back cover of my book, uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Sam Zell. They call him the grave dancer, and I'll tell you why, but I went and met him last week. I flew to Chicago because he did write a my number one testimonial on the back of the book. According to Forbes, he's worth six billion dollars. Um, he's you know still drives his motorcycle around on the weekends in Chicago. Um, great, great man. We had a great meeting. Um, but uh, the reason they call him the grave dancer is because he 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 was quoted as saying he likes to find these really good bargain companies and right where they're kind of near the grave. They're, in other words, they're distressed. He comes in and buys them. And so we like, we, I've actually written some articles talking about how to invest like a grave dancer. Um, but listen, back to, back to corporate taxes again, REITs don't really have those problems. And I think that's another great area to invest in. And I encourage everyone to you know, look at my book. I actually teach out of the book now, friends at NYU. I just finished up my first class yeah. at NYU virtually, which by the way, is the largest real estate school in the world. Uh, mm. Over 700 real estate undergrad and graduate students there. So um, uh, anyway, that's that's uh, I'd love to uh, you know get back on anytime and talk about real estate or anything else because it's always great to be uh, you know, be on this what I think is the coolest show that I've ever been on here, which is your you know the Prince Dyke show. Thanks. I definitely appreciate. It. You know what? One thing, you know, uh, Brad, I will say when I looked at your book, I was like, wow, all these testimonies from all these billionaires and highly successful people. But there was no Prince Dice testimonial in there. Why is that, Brad? What happened? What's, what's up with that? How can I get some love? Wow, that is that is true. That is true. I uh, <laughs> we're going to have to do something there. No, no, actually, that's that will definitely be in the next edition. By the way. I've got another book I'm writing on, and it's called the 10, uh, how else the title of this is going to be, the, you know, the 10 wealthiest real estate investors mm. of all time. And I'm going to keep it U.S. Uh, I think Zell definitely is on that list. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, look, there's, again, real estate is a great asset class to be in. And for owning REITs is the way to go, because, again, you don't have to deal with the three T's. Uh, Prince, you don't have to deal with the toilets, the trash, or the tenants. And just remember okay. that, you know, next time, if you don't, if you invest in REITs, you don't have to deal with the three T's. Got it. All right, Brad. So how can people follow you? How can they catch up with you? How can they get more from you? Yeah, well, I've got a real simple website uh, called bradtom.com. So just visit bradtom, T-O-M.com. And uh, you can check us out, sign up for our free e-blast. We do a e-blast five days a week. Again, it's all about education. It didn't cost you anything to sign up for the blast. And we always have promotions going out. We have various newsletter products. Of course, always have a book in the works. And uh, I'd love to get you on my podcast as well. So I uh, definitely want to reach out for, the, for that. Nice, nice. Thank you. Definitely appreciate that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Brad, you know, I can go on for hours with you, sitting down with you. But I know people at down there in Think Tech Hawaii, they have other plans. Ladies and gentlemen, it was great. It was wonderful. Until the next video, podcast, cartoon, or whatever else crazy you see us doing around the globe. Peace, be safe. I'm out, and thank you.